Dzień dobry Państwu. Rozpoczniemy, rozpoczniemy seminarium. Dzisiaj będziemy mieć gościa z Los Alamos National Laboratory. Będzie to dr Char Farrar, który jest jednym z liderów w Narodowym Laboratorium w Los Alamos w Instytucie Inżynierii i odpowiada za badania i edukację oraz o współ, za współpracę z University of California San Diego. On się, jego zainteresowania naukowe to przede wszystkim Structural Health Monitoring i tutaj razem pracowaliśmy w tej dziedzinie przez no, wiele, wiele lat. Czak opublikował około 40, 400 prac oraz książkę zatytułowaną Structural Health Monitoring and Machine Learning Perspective. No, to jest taka Biblia w tym zakresie. W 2012 roku był wybrany jako fellow z Los Alamos National Laboratory. On jest też fellow w Amerykańskim Towarzystwie Inżynierów Mechaników, Amerykańskim Towarzystwie Budownictwa oraz w oraz w Society for Experimental Mechanics. Ok, I see Chuck. That's welcome. And I introduce you if you waited for uploading the software. That's you can start your talk, please. But uh, you should switch uh, on your microphone, Chuck. Okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, 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 now it's okay. Okay, well, first let me thank Tadish for inviting me to do this talk. I'm, uh, the title of the talk is uh, Engineering Space Mission Support at Los Alamos National Laboratory. My name is, uh, uh, I go by Chuck Farrar. I'm the engineering institute leader at Los Alamos. And uh, at first, I just want to make a couple of acknowledgments. So uh, this talk represents the work of a lot of people at our laboratory. And I wouldn't have really been able to pull it together without some help from two of my colleagues, uh, Dave Clark, who's an actinide chemist, and you'll see why as we get a little further down, that would have anything to do with these uh, space activities, and Ed Benamore, who's an astrophysicist at our laboratory. So again, I want to emphasize that what I'm going to talk about is a lot of people's work. I've only had uh, in two of the activities that I'll list here had small roles. Um, and this, uh, the, these activities have really occurred over a long time frame, almost 65 years now. And then just a couple, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of other space related activities at the lab that I'm not going to cover due to the limited time. And in most of the, in almost all the cases here, Los Alamos is not the only participant in these activities. They are joint missions. And certainly there are a lot of other related missions at other institutes, uh, government agencies worldwide. We're not the only ones doing the things that uh, I'm going to present in this talk. Um, so let's see, will this, uh, nope. I think the, all right. So first of all, I think when people, uh, when somebody mentions Los Alamos National, laboratory. Most people think about uh, the Manhattan Project and the role we had there. So uh, they tend not to think about our space-related activities. 
Okay, and our space related activities were not part of our original mission. Uh, we started before, just as rockets were starting to become uh, a useful uh, technology. So our mission continues to be the same. The primary mission of our laboratory tends uh, continues to be the same as when we were founded, in that we're providing and we we continue to provide the majority of the U.S. Uh, is nuclear deterrent. And these there's a lot of space related engineering issues with these systems, but for obvious reasons, that's not going to be the focus of the talk today. And just uh, to give you a little bit of idea, our laboratory is located in northern New Mexico, as you can see in the map of the United States on the right. It's a pretty big place. We're spread out. I've shown in the upper left the image where the laboratory is overlaid on a map of Washington, D.C. So, you know, we're approximately not quite the same size, cover the same area as the city of Washington, D.C. We're located at 2,300 meters elevation. There's about 13,000 employees at the laboratory. About 1,800 of them have PhDs in uh, science, engineering, and math. And our annual operating budget actually exceeds right now about $3 billion U.S. a year. OK. So our space-related activities can be broadly characterized in four areas. So the first one I've listed, there, and they're in no particular order here, is satellites and space-based instrumentation. And really what you're going to see is that this comes down to monitoring various bandwidths of the electromagnetic spectrum with different types of interest instruments, monitoring particles, um, and a lot of this originated with a focus on being able to identify nuclear weapons testing uh, and was part of uh, various treaty verification efforts, but it's evolved way beyond that. The other big area is space power systems. And we'll, uh, we make uh, radioisotope heat sources, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, space-based nuclear power reactors, and thermal nuclear rocket engines. Another area then is, uh, you know, a lot of this, the satellite work and instrumentation work is put up to collect data. Once we have that data, we need to analyze and interpret it. And we do that both from ground-based and space-based instruments. And then finally, uh, we do modeling of the observed physical phenomena. Items three and four tend to be done much more by the astrophysics community at the laboratory, whereas the engineering uh, component at the laboratory has a bigger uh, role in the first two items. And unfortunately, I don't have updated data, but as of 2014, Los Alamos had contributed to 233 different space missions. So this space-related work really started in the 1950s, and it evolved uh, after a, um, a speech that uh, President, then President Eisenhower gave at the United Nations, where they descri he described a vision for international management of atomic energy and its development for peaceful purposes. And that became known as kind of the Atoms for Peace initiative. And out of that, in 1955, came two uh, <clears throat> power-related programs that Los Alamos was involved with. The first, uh, SNAP, which is Systems for Nuclear Auxiliary Power, was one that looked at using radio isotopes and nuclear reactors for power sources for satellites. And the other was called Rover, which is a nuclear thermal rocket program. Ooh. 
So the rover and then a follow on uh, program called NERVA was uh, the design and testing of nuclear thermal rocket engines. And we use the term nuclear thermal here because we're, we don't want to give the idea that there's a nuclear explosion that is driving the uh, is providing the propulsion. It's a nuclear reactor, really, that is providing the heat that takes liquid uh, helium uh, and turns it into the propellant for the rocket. Um, and this project ran from 1955 to 1973. It, again, it has its origins more in defense applications, but it evolved to uh, plans to support a Mars mission in 1979 and a permanent moon base in 1981. So <clears throat> the, these concepts use a solid graphite core nuclear re reactor to hit heat liquid hydrogen, which in turn then provides the thrust as it expands through a nozzle. And there were three designs. Um, I showed uh, one of the earlier designs in its test stand at the Nevada test site in the early 1960. So based on the, uh, the results of the Rover program, then the NERVA program evolved, and that was actually uh, uh, taking the results of Rover and trying to now make a deployable rocket engine that could survive things like launch environments. Uh, so there's some real engineering challenges with these approaches. A lot of them uh, stem from the really high core temperatures of the reactor and the hydrogen working fluid. So I did a comparison there of what the core temperature is in the Kiwi reactor uh, for the the thermal based rocket versus a commercial power pressurized water reactor. And to, to get the most um, propulsion, you want that uh, core temperature as high as possible. The hydrogen, in addition to the thermal issues, then the hydrogen also provides challenges from a corrosion standpoint for the design of these systems. At the end of the program, and the program when it was completed had met all of its design uh, um, goals. So they were uh, <clears throat> able to obtain uh, 4,500 <clears throat> 4, megawatts of thermal power, an exhaust temperature in excess of 3,000 degrees Kelvin, um, <clears throat> and unfortunately I have this in English units, 25 uh, 250,000 pounds of thrust, uh, again, it, over, they can generate an 850 second impulse, 90 minutes of burn time, and a thrust to weight ratio on the order of three to four. All right, um, but because of budget constraints, other things that were at the, uh, in, at the time when the program was closed, we had things like the Apollo mission going on, we were having to pay for the Vietnam War. Uh, the program got canceled. One of the things that came out of the program, a technology, is the modern capillary-based heat pipe, which is a heat transfer, a very efficient heat transfer mechanism. And I've shown in a cartoon form the principle of operation of a heat pipe. Um, so the heat uh, comes in. It evaporates the working fluid, which flows uh, through the tube, condenses, uh, and gives up its heat. And then the uh, working fluid is transferred back through capillary action in a wicking material. Okay. This is really desire, this type of heat transfer mecha mechanism is really desirable for space applications because there's no moving parts. There's no power requirements. It works in a zero G environment and it can actually transport heat over fairly long distances. So one of the applications then is uh, <clears throat> space applications is cooling of the electronics on geostationary satellites. But it's also that technology has also made its way into cooling uh, CPUs on laptops and maintaining the permafrost under the foundations of the Alaska pipeline.
Okay, so a big effort at Los Alamos uh, that is kind of spun out of this then is uh, space power systems. And all right, the rover uh, reactors never flew in space. They were only ground tested. Um, but what has made its way into space are these radioisotope power systems. And these power systems are both thermal and electric systems. And they've played a role in at least, I believe, every deep space mission that the US has been involved in. And they, they're kind of two forms. There's a radioisotope heat source, uh, and there's a radioisotope thermoelectric generators. And all of these power systems uh, use plutonium-238. They have a lot of advantages. Uh, so they can operate continuously. They don't require sunlight like solar panels do. They have really long life, as we'll see in the next slide, and very and they're very reliable. They, they are tolerant to hostile environments. Um, they have very predictable performance. They're relatively small in form, and they can provide both heat and electricity for the spacecraft. So as an example, I've, on the right, I've shown the Cassini spacecraft that has 333 uh, Los Alamos power sources on it. Um, 117 of those are to heat the spacecraft components. And then 216 plutonium oxide uh, pellets provide the electric power for the system. So these radioisotope power sources uh, come in different forms. I've shown here this general purpose heat source uh, and where we've in a containment have the uh, 150 uh, plus grams of plutonium oxide. Um, there's uh, this special cladding around them. And uh, one of the difficulties or engineering challenges is that um, that they produce uh, this, uh, the decay of the plutonium produces helium gas, which has to be vented. Okay, and so these um, heat sources produce about 60 watts thermal energy, and then they're assembled at the Idaho National Engineering Lab into an electric generator. In addition, we have these lightweight uh, <clears throat> radioisotope heating units, again, that have a smaller amount of plutonium oxide, various cladding materials, they produce about one watt of thermal energy. Both of these, though, have been designed and had to be designed such that they could withstand an accident scenario and not distribute uh, plutonium into the atmosphere if there was a problem during launch. So, um, but here's uh, why uh, <clears throat> these, these are uh, set, so useful in deep space missions. And I recently watched a documentary on the Voyager spacecraft. And nowhere in that one hour documentary did they ever mention, how do you power something for so long? Okay, well, both Voyager 1 and 2, which were launched in 1977, contain uh, radioisotope uh, thermoelectric generators. Okay, so they uh, have um, about 250 grams of plutonium oxide in these uh, radioisotope thermal generators that provide about 475 watts of electric power. And they've been functioning for four decades. That's a really long time to power systems. So you really got to think about with anything in deep space beyond where you can power with solar panels. You know, how do you do that? And, the, and these radioisotopes are really the only practical solution for these deep space missions. OK, so uh, we continue to work on these space reactors. Um, so one of the projects that came after uh, 
the Rover and Nerva project was the SP-100 project. Again, it had uh, its origins for defense applications. But the real goal was to develop a small, flexible, multi-mission fission power system for both spacecraft and that could be used for surface power uh, for lunar and Martian exploration. And these uh, systems were designed to be scalable where the power ranges could be uh, from tens to hundreds of kilowatts. And again, these reactors uh, made use of heat pipes as the heat transfer mechanism. It takes the reactor heat and uh, transfers it to the thermionic electric converters. And still, if we move further, and this is a program that is ongoing right now, uh, we have the, uh, we're in the process of de developing what is called the Krusty reactor to support planetary exploration. So Krusty is an acronym for kilowatt reactor using Stirling technology for the, uh, <clears throat> the power source. So, this is a collaboration between Los Alamos and NASA. The goal is to develop a fission reactor that can develop, uh, deliver between one and 10 uh, kilowatts of electric power that's gonna be reliable, low cost, compact, and provide that power for a 12 to 15 year uh, time span. With again, the goals being applications to lunar and planetary planetary exploration, and you can see uh, an image that from NASA's website that uh, where they have the artist's conception of a of the crusty reactor being deployed on Mars to uh, power a base there for human occupation. So again, they use uh, heat pipes, uh, liquid sodium heat pipes, transfer the reactor core heat to the Stirling engines, which drive the electric generators. A prototype of this reactor was tested in 2017 and 2018, ground tested. And these were the first US ground tests of a space reactor since the SNAP program in uh, 1965. Okay, and kind of uh, a power related one, one, a very unique project that we had in the uh, late 1980s was something called uh, the BEAR project or beam experiment aboard rocket. And this was a, uh, a where we put a small linear accelerator as the payload in a rocket that was sub launched from White Sands Missile Range, which is in southern New Mexico, about um, 300 kilometers from Los Alamos. Uh, it was suborbital, and it was the first time a, an accelerator had been put into space, and we fired a neutral particle beam accelerator. So an accelerator usually ha uh, launches charged particles. You need that to do the, uh, to accelerate them. And then, uh, and then uh, you strip the charge off of the particle at the very end so that the Earth's magnetic field does not deflect the beam. And you can see we fired uh, the uh, various pulses with the uh, system for a short, uh, about 11 minutes in space. Uh, the accelerator was recovered. Uh, the, the rocket, uh, the payload came back down, recovered. And even though it wasn't designed for recovery, uh, it turned out that they could turn the accelerator on once it was back on the ground and it continued to operate. So uh, as I mentioned, we uh, do a lot, uh, probably our, I would guess our biggest role is putting instrumentations on satellites. And uh, that, that process started very, very early on with the Bella satellites. And these uh, were developed to monitor the nuclear test ban treaty that was signed in 1963 uh 
And so the first, and you can see in the artist's conception up on the right, these are launched as a pair of satellites. And there were 12 Vela satellites put into uh, orbit between 1963 and the early 1970s. And so these satellites carried Los Alamos designed and built sensors for detecting light, X-rays, gamma rays, neutrons, electromagnetic pulses, and the natural radiation background. And it turned out they uh, made one of uh, the biggest discoveries in uh, astro uh, space science with these uh, <clears throat> with these satellites. So they uh, detected gamma ray bursts, which are the most energetic uh, events that occur in the universe, and they result from the uh, birth of black holes. And they've been detected as far uh, at the as far back in time, uh, almost uh, 13 billion years uh, back in time. So at the edge of the observable universe. But what really allowed their detect, so they put these the systems up with gamma ray detectors and they started seeing uh, indications of gamma rays and they weren't sure what the source was. But because they had multiple satellites and as the timing systems on those satellite, each generation of those satellites improved, um, they could they could triangulate and locate that the uh, the source of the gamma rays was coming from outside the solar system. So we've we've continued with that. Uh, another example is uh, the Alexis satellite. Um, so this. These satellites were designed to study uh, UV emissions from stars and RF emissions from Earth. They were put in, this satellite was put into orbit in 1997 from Edwards Air Force Base in California. It's a different type of launch vehicle. In this case, the Pegasus launch vehicle is taken up by an aircraft to about 35,000 feet and then the rocket is dropped from the aircraft which then takes it into space so you can see just based on the image in the lower right that the payload is relatively small that goes on these and this was the first time we did the complete construction of the satellite at los alamos but uh, a failure of one of the brackets that holds the solar panels that you can see deployed there um, caused, caused that panel not to deploy and consequently the satellite couldn't get enough power. And the satellite had an automatic system on it that would shut itself down when it was losing power. So it took months uh, before we could establish communication because of that one failed solar panel. Once we could establish communication, then they could uh, correct for that failure. But this was a kind of a lesson learned was not to rely on, on such complex automated control systems. Uh, <clears throat> after the Alexis, uh, we built the Forte satellite, which in the Forte is an acronym for fast on orbit rapid recording of transient events. And so this was satellite was de designed to monitor RF and optical emissions from lightning in the ionosphere. Uh, it had onboard digital signal processing event-based classifier. So this starts getting where we're starting to do now uh, the assessment of the signals on board. Uh, <clears throat> and with this capability, uh, at, with the demonstration of this capability, there was. Uh, this evolved into ways of doing severe weather condition monitoring. It was the first all composite spacecraft design. And I think one of the engineering challenges, if you look at the image on the right, you'll see that there's a very long, a 10 meter long antenna. And that antenna had to be compressed into about a 30 centimeter thick um, container 
to uh, make the uh, satellite small enough for launch. Okay. So another uh, uh, different type of instrumentation that we have been involved with and really have the lead on is the development of the KenCam uh, uh, instrument on the Curiosity rover and the SuperCam instrument on uh, the Mars Perseverance. And these uh, perform laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. So uh, what you can't see, you can kind of see what looks like a camera lens there. But uh, in addition, there's a laser that fires from that instrument. And the laser will vaporize small portions of rock, creating a hot plasma. And then uh, through spectrum analysis of the emitted light, the rock composition can be identified. Okay, so in addition, uh, the Mars rovers, if you go back uh, and look, and there's no solar panels on those rovers. So again, we're using the radioisotope thermal generators to power the rover. So on the Curiosity rover, we have what we call a multi-mission RTG, meaning uh, they're designed for other applications and uh, they provide 110 uh, watts of electric power that run 11 different instruments on the Curiosity rover. So the uh, <clears throat> Perseverance rover also has a multi-mission RTG, as well as 32 radioisotope heat sources. And these are designed to provide power for 14 years. And uh, uh, starting in about the 2010 time frame, we have started to work on CubeSats. These are really small uh, satellites that can go on, uh, and it's much easier to get a ride into space with these uh, small devices. Um, the first one, Perseus, that we developed is, and it's they use these uh, units uh, to define the size of a CubeSat. And one, one unit is a, a 10 centimeter cube. So they're a little bit bigger than that. It was launched off of a SpaceX rocket in 2010. And it was really to just to develop, demonstrate the ability to develop a rapid response satellite. They were made entirely from off the shelf components, uh, very inexpensive. And the ground stations that they communicated with were very inexpensive. And you can see the first ones just would, uh, were in orbit for a short amount of time. We've evolved to a, a, a more significant CubeSat uh, with more improved communications, better onboard processing and autonomous operations that uh, are in a higher orbit and for a longer period of time. So again, uh, there's a, component of this, uh, we have at, La, at Los Alamos um, various science pillars. And one of them is referred to as science of signatures. And these science pillars are things that our laboratory has to be good at to deliver on its mission. So the idea of the science of signatures is both building improved sensors and doing a better job of interpreting the data that come from those sensors. So uh, one of the, uh, an example of this is uh, the SWIFT satellite. Again, this is a satellite that uh, Los Alamos had a role in. I don't know if you'd say we were the lead developer of it, but uh, the purpose of the Swiss SWIFT satellite was to do automated detection of gamma ray bursts. All right, and it was the first self-tasking satellite that designed to autonomous, autonomously find unusual cosmic events. So the, the system has on board the ability to decide where to image based on a burst alert telescope that uses coded aperture masks with a uh, X-ray detector. 
Then it has an X-ray telescope that further refines the location and then UV and optical telescopes that are used once they have the SWIFT satellite has slewed into position to observe the gamma ray burst. And so this required a lot of software uh, engineering to uh, uh, control, to interpret the data that's coming from the satellites and control the satellite positioning. Okay, so if we're looking at where things are going in the future, at least things that we will be involved with at Los Alamos, um, NASA is uh, and the DOE are, uh, are working on a nuclear powered helicopter that will uh, fly on Titan. So again, this will use radio isotope thermal electric generators to power the rotorcraft, and uh, and that will be used to explore uh, Saturn's largest moon. And this mission is expected to launch in 2026 with an arrival date of uh, 2034. And then, as you'll see it uh, here, things kind of go uh, full circle. So this uh, in July of this year, the Department of Energy and NASA funded the, the uh, development of three nuclear thermal nuclear propulsion design concepts, which is exactly what the ROVA and NERVA uh, program from the start of the 1950s and 1960s were doing. And the, the motive for this is it cuts uh, if we're going to do a manned mission to Mars, it's going to cut the transit time almost in half. So, so just to uh, then to conclude, what I thought, uh, um, there's a lot of engineering challenges uh, for exploring space. And successful missions need innovative mechanical, electrical, materials, software, and nuclear engineering. And a lot of times, in a, uh, you have to bring those together in an integrated manner. But I just listed out some uh, challenges. So in the me mechanical area, thermal management, and that is both heating and cooling, is, uh, uh, is, a, is always a challenge, and it's a difficult one to test on the ground. Um, shock and vibration, uh, you have to make sure that the system survived the launch, the deployment, they have to be robust for accident scenarios. Depending on the type of mission, they might have to uh, be robust for reentry and retrieval. In, a, in the electrical engineering area, radiation hardening of electronics. Um, we can do ground testing in specialized facilities like linear accelerators, test reactors, synchrotrons. Um, telemetry, in some of the cases with the uh, uh, Earth orbiting satellites, we actually transfer data to an Iridium satellite and then to Earth. Uh, we have to worry about, depending on uh, the materials and, you know, if we're looking at these reactors of materials, temperature variations uh, um, cause issues. Uh, software, we're trying to put more intelligence on the satellite, so sometimes screening the data and only sending pertinent data to ground. Um, and then there, the software also controls the remote operations. So, and then finally, uh, the nuclear engineering, you know, we want to be able to manage the decaying power availability, manage the radio uh, uh, active decay particles. And this is just a sample. There are a lot of others. So I think with your new Space Technology Institute, there's just a wide array of uh, problems to address and areas uh, for creative thinking by your students as they uh, undertake these various space-related activities. So with that, I'm going to conclude and uh, I'll try and answer questions. Again, I have not been involved in lots of these, so uh, I, my ability to do that is going to be varied depending on the different uh, projects that you ask about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chuck, for a very excellent uh, talk uh, that was exciting. That's, uh, now we have a time for questions. 
the question uh, should be written in the chat. This is a, a channel of communication uh, with a speaker. If you have any, uh, please write in the chat. Chuck, I have one question to you. Uh, sure. There is, there is some uh, SHM systems or uh, self-healing systems installed on satellites? You know about such an installation or not? Um, I am not aware of the ones that we do. You know, uh, we do an extensive amount of ground testing, particularly in the shock and vibration arena, to try and make sure that the system will survive. And uh, but I'm not sure about uh, self healing. The closest thing would be in the software regime. They do have the ability. Uh, when they run into problems to upload new software and uh, that will alter the control of the system. Um, that's the closest thing that I'm aware of on these systems. So, but again, I'm not sure that I would know everything that's being done. Um, okay, thank you. They, they, we have a question. Do you see, Chuck, the question? Yes, uh, I don't. Uh, I uh, the the energy density of the americium is not as high as the plutonium, and so I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, so they certainly have looked at that here, but uh, with the the mission needs the uh, plutonium appear, appeared to be a better uh, source. Okay, thank you. The, the next questions will come. Okay, I see that uh, they are writing the, the questions, but I don't see these questions. I was just going, uh, while I'm waiting, okay. I was going to get the... Yeah, we have a next question. Okay. Uh, yeah, so they, uh, you know, I've heard uh, from my colleagues, so we have an entire division at our laboratory that works on these space systems. And I have heard for them that the uh, that the space debris problem is a very significant problem. I think if you saw in the news, I think they had to just re recently reposition um, the International Space Station because of some debris that was in its path. Uh, but right now, I am I don't know is the answer about uh, um, approaches to collecting the debris. I would tend to think that that would. For, for us at Los Alamos would not be a role that we play, but I don't know that. Is there a plan to implement some? And then uh, the next one as well. Um, I'm not aware of any plans uh, um, to uh, address remaining useful life concepts is there a plan to implement semi-autonomous systems like physics-informed neural networks to address uh, remaining useful life concepts? My understanding right now is uh, with the satellites uh, and a lot of these systems, they're planning uh, the, the entire operation, every minute of operation on the ground beforehand. Um, that my colleagues say that it's very risky trying to upload new software and change uh, the controls. So, um, 
So I don't know, uh, and again, with remaining useful life concepts, um, they do have a, all of these go up with a specific design life to the best of my knowledge. And in some cases though, they last beyond that design life. Okay. Uh, I don't see more questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chuck, again. Okay, is is the next last question I see G about the digital twin for power system? Huh. Uh, I am not aware of that. No. Um, but I thought I wanted to uh, hold on just a second. See if I could get you uh, the, the the person who asked about. Uh, the americium 241. So the specific power in watts per kilogram for plutonium 238 is 567.6. The specific power in watts per kilogram for the americium 241 is 114. So roughly a factor of five difference in the power density. Yeah. Um, between the uh, um, plutonium-238 and the americium-241. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you, Chuck. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your excellent talk. And I hope the next uh, seminar we will organize uh, in, uh, with your present in, presence in Krakow, please. I would love to come back to Krakow. Invited to come to Krakow to enjoy the city and to spend some time with us for the discussions and and uh, and uh, also uh, networking. Thank you. Yes. Thank uh, you. It's my favorite place to visit in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank you, audience, for coming and for being with us. Thank you very much again. Okay, you're welcome.